The coagulation cascade is one of those topics that you learn, forget, and relearn countless times during your time in medical school. It's not uncommon to forget which factors are part of the intrinsic or extrinsic pathways, which test is used to assess each one, or even where in the pathway different drugs act. I'm going to put these together in one place and show you some tricks to remember particular bits. So this is the skeleton to the coagulation cascade. I'll draw the intrinsic pathway in red. It results from contact activation where there is surface damage and features factors 12, 11, 9 and 8. The extrinsic pathway is here in blue and it results from trauma or inflammation that leads to tissue factor release. Remember also that tissue factor is also known as factor 3. Tissue factor and activated factor 7 form a complex together that can then activate factor 10. As you can see, the factor 7 and tissue factor complex, as well as factor 8, both activate factor 10. And this is therefore where both pathways meet and become the common pathway, shown in purple. Activated factor 10 causes prothrombin to become active thrombin, known as factor 2, which then cleaves fibrinogen into fibrin, also known as factor 1, and ultimately leads to clot formation. As a side note, factor 5 is a cofactor, while the other factors are enzymatically active, and activated factor 5 is needed alongside calcium in order for activated factor 10 to convert prothrombin into thrombin. The way I remember which factors are in the intrinsic pathway and which are extrinsic is by thinking of when they do countdowns. For example, they say countdown in 3, 2, 1, but this time we remember that the countdown is in the intrinsic pathway, 12, 11, 9, Eight. Another way is that the extrinsic pathway contains factors 7 and 3, which is tissue factor, and so they sum up to 10, which is also written as an X. It's a bit of a stretch, but it helps me remember them. As for the lab tests, APTT is the activated thromboplastin time, also referred to as PTT, while PT is the prothrombin time. The way to remember which test looks at which pathway is by remembering that you play table tennis inside while you play tennis outside. Remember the PTT and PT tests also evaluate the common pathway too, so factors 10, 5, 2 and 1. The PTT is normally 25 to 29 seconds, while the PT is usually about 12 seconds, but these values change between labs. Another important thing to remember is the vitamin K dependent factors which are factors 2, 7, 9 and 10. So causes for a prolonged PTT time with a normal PT include a deficiency in factor 8, for example in haemophilia A or von Willebrand's disease, a deficiency in factor 9 seen in haemophilia B or deficiencies in factors 11 or 12. A prolonged PT with a normal PTT can come from factor 7 deficiency it may also be a sign of incoming disseminated intravascular coagulation or an early sign of vitamin K antagonism, since factor 7 is the factor with the shortest half-life. This means that in the early stages, the remaining vitamin K dependent factors, which are 2, 9 and 10, are not affected as much. If both the PT and PTT are prolonged, then causes include decreased vitamin K activity that's more developed. So again, a vitamin K deficiency from a lack of intake or excessive warfarin treatment. As well as this, moderate to severe disseminated intravascular coagulation or liver disease may also be causes. Treatment with high doses of heparin or direct oral anticoagulant drugs can also cause a prolonged PT and PTT. Drugs used to prevent clotting act on different locations on this pathway. Heparin works by binding to antithrombin 3 and increasing antithrombin 3 activity which works to inhibit activated factor 10 and thrombin. Low molecular weight heparins like enoxaparin and deltaparin work in a similar way, but the antithrombin 3 low molecular weight heparin complex has less or no activity against thrombin while having a more specific affinity for activated factor 10. Warfarin is a vitamin K reductase inhibitor and vitamin K reductase is needed to restore vitamin K back to its activated state. If this can't happen, then no activated vitamin K is available to form the vitamin K dependent factors, and so less of these factors are synthesized. It takes time, however, for the amount of activated vitamin K to decrease significantly, 
and therefore for synthesis to stop. So this is why patients often are given heparin for a few days while waiting for the warfarin to work. In fact, warfarin actually promotes clotting in the first few days because it also inhibits protein C and protein S, which are anticoagulant molecules involved in inhibiting factor V. The direct oral anticoagulants, DOAX, sometimes called NOAX, work by directly binding thrombin or activated factor X. Rivaroxaban and apixaban are examples of direct activated factor X inhibitors, while agatraban and dabigatran are examples of direct thrombin inhibitors. You can see this difference in the name, with rivaroxaban, for example, featuring factor XA ban in the name. The effects of heparin can be reversed with protamine sulfate, a compound that binds tightly to the heparin or the low molecular weight heparin, forming a compound with no anticoagulant properties. The antidote to warfarin is vitamin K, but just as warfarin takes time to work, the antidote also takes a while because new factors need to be synthesized. Fresh frozen plasma and prothrombin complex concentrate may be given for immediate reversal, but you still need vitamin K to maintain it. Ibrokezumab, a monoclonal antibody, is given as an antidote for dabigatran, while Andexonet-alpha was recently approved as an antidote for the direct factor 10 inhibitors.